people tell me I have a very distinct sound, like I play one note and they know it's Marcus, right? It comes from my inside, but I would, wouldn't say that it is me. I think the, the music, this creation is kind of like its own being somehow. Hello, Marcus. Hi, Andres. How are you doing? Good. I have the absolute pleasure today to have a very, very special guest. A person that I have admired for, for a while so far because of his vast amount of work. And for those who doesn't know Marcus Reuter, he's a composer, an inventor, actually, a kind of guitarist, <laughs> a producer. Uh, Marcus Reuter started out as a, as a pianist. Then he turned into something very different that we're going to discuss today, which is this touch guitar, taking what some people would say Robert Fripp's cool technique to the next, to the next level. He has been a member of multiple bands, ensembles and different projects, including uh, Zentrosun, Stickman, uh, with uh, the legendary Tony Levin, with Pat Mastelotto from King Crimson. He also had a, a remember a project with, with Pat Mastelotto himself called Tuner. Yeah. Uh, he was at the Crimson Project with another hero of myself, Adrian Ballou. And he, you were recently, before the pandemic, I think, touring with uh, Devin Thompson yes. uh, on this yeah. beautiful and crazy empath tour. He basically became a master of the touch guitar to the extent that he even designed his own instrument in collaboration with, with uh, a luthier, uh, Ed Reynolds. So to talk about music, to talk about creativity, to, to talk about unusual instruments uh, is that I have the pleasure to be today with uh, with Marcus Reuter. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't forget that um, I'm also a psychologist. Yes, I'm going to get there. But I haven't, haven't practiced in a long time and I'm yeah. not um, good with the vocabulary anymore. That's, that's, I think that's better in some, okay. in some sense. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to poke you about that later on. As it's the spirit of this channel, I want to try to start with the experience. In particular, uh, Marcus uh, plays a very, very interesting instrument in a very, very interesting way. So it's like a combination of the instrument plus the way how he plays it. So what I'm going to do now is to play one of his tunes. This song is called Justified. And we're going to listen together. You're going to listen to as well. And then we're going to start the interview with whatever mood you are in after it. <laughs> so let's do that now. Thank you. 
Okay. That was great. If I have learned something about the brain, is that it doesn't process any information from outside, just a bit. So most of the stuff that music or anything evokes, it's mainly internally driven. So it's it's like a very basic interaction between whatever it comes from outside, but mainly driven by an internal force, whatever that is, whatever your mood is at the moment, whatever your history is, whatever is going on in your brain at that time. So I can understand, for instance, that for some people, what they just heard makes them a bit uncomfortable because it's not, it's not located possibly in the right places of what people might consider palatable in a more westernized 21st century way. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, but in yeah. my case, I feel really, really comfortable with this type of music. I don't know. I don't know why. My first question for you would be, um, how does the creative process of something, of coming with something like this happen? So what is the underlying breeding of this, of this uh, process in your brain? What's going on, Marcus? Tell us. You see, like, um, it's obviously something that goes back like a long time for me, like almost 30 years. Uh, to prepare myself to be, a to be able to do something like this, because this composition is composed in the moment. And really, uh, the, the, the actual process of creating that piece actually just happens in that moment. There's no preconception other than maybe, and this is the, the big question, the mood I'm in, the people that are around me, uh, you know, the room, whatever it's difficult to tell but from my experience and this is something that fits in with what you said uh, it really does not come much from the outside it mostly is being generated on the inside and the funny thing is like even though people tell me i have a very distinct sound like i play one note and they know it's marcus right or I play a piece like this and they know it's Marcus, there's a certain atmosphere about it or whatever, a certain aesthetic. It comes from my inside, but I would, wouldn't say that it is me. And that is, that's what makes it so interesting to okay. me also. Like, obviously, like we could make, make it simple for ourselves and we could just simply say, okay, that what Marcus creates there is him. That's what is on his inside. That's, that's his mood or whatever, whatever mood you experience as you listen to it, uh, you know, you may uh, project onto me. But I think that's not the case. I think the, the music, this creation is kind of like its own, it's, a, it's its own being somehow. Would you agree with the statement that you're more, you're more like, a, like a channel for something, you're channeling something else from somewhere, uh, more than you being the agent of the music yes but like, as you were, we were already saying i think not channeling from somewhere else but it's channeling from the inside somehow okay so what i what i mean is that the initial trigger is probably just the intention to do something right so so and that's that's what is sort of like the initial uh you could say ve vehicle that that goes into that channel right somehow it's that energy that's being put into that or it's the initial yeah it's the trigger basically right i have used the channel metaphor before and uh, you know in my past but it's really uh not super precise because that feels as if there's something outside that then comes through through you and i think it's you know i think that the 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 creative principle or what what some people call creation or god or whatever is is uh is that that spark is basically the, the that initial trigger right so and and but then the trigger uh unfolds within the within me whatever that is right so that's that's sort of like how i experience it and then obviously like the question is of how does the environment influence that is a big question actually uh but i would i would tend to say that you are right that most of it happens um inside and whatever that means whatever right? that means exactly <laughs> yeah yes yeah. 
Okay, in order to be more precise, uh, would you say, for instance, that most of the, when you're creating something, let's say, not necessarily when you're fully improvising, but probably you have an idea of what's going to happen in the next 10 seconds, possibly not what's going to happen in the next two minutes. My, maybe the, the horizon is, I don't know, what's your horizon for the next part of the piece, but do you hear it? Do you hear what's next? Do you see no. what's next? Do you feel what's next? What's, no. what, what's going on? No. So, so it's really not about what's next. It's about what is now. Okay. And because what is now is what is next. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's listening. The, the, what I'm doing is I'm listening. And if you watch me closely as I play this piece, as I compose this piece, you can see that I'm sort of like in this state of kind of like, let's say, going forward to maybe play something. And then I, I stop and I wait and I go back and I like I kind of like go with the wave of whatever I'm I'm hearing, I'm listening. And so like one of the uh, like if we uh, want to break it down, like one of the, the tricks is obviously not to always play on top of what you already played. Right. So so like what you're starting to to develop, like the sense for space. So. Like, okay, there's a space, so I may, if I want to play a note, I'd rather play it where there is space and not where there's no space. So that's like, that's like a simple back and forth. And you see that this piece, even though the looping devices I'm using there, they're running free. They don't have a time, a fixed time setting, right? But there's a rhythm to it. There's like a breathing rhythm to this piece. And like when I play notes in sequence, they have a certain spacing. But that spacing totally comes out of the, um, it emerges from the, the, the particles of that music being put together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, so no, there is, there is no, there is no premonition uh, of any sort there. Wow. I mean, this, this piece is, is um, kind of a good example for a composition that works within the space of one musical mode. So, so there's a clear rule here, let's say, okay, to only use those notes. But now what you need to know is that when I start playing, I have no idea what that mode is going to be. I play a first note and I play a second note and that, that collection of pitches appears as I play them. And, and then it's just a question of like saying, no, okay, I'm not going to add more and I'm going to restrict myself to a certain palette. And obviously that is something that sort of like is being carried sort of like in the back of my head as a table of possibilities, let's say. Uh, Meister Ackert has uh, this very nice phrase that I really like, that uh, um, silence is the presence of God. And to me, I think I appreciate your style in particular because it lets you breathe. Mm -hmm. You can breathe. You can breathe with the composition. It's not a ammunition of notes one after another in a non... I'm not, I don't want to criticize any type of music, but... But there are some styles that are that full of notes and not that many spaces between notes to actually breathe. And but this music is actually it allows you to go with the flow, literally. And cognitively speaking, if you want to process something in a more meaningful way, you need space. That's why when we chat, for instance, in between me and you responding, there are at least three seconds. There is kind of a rule that the brain needs to process whatever I said first in order for you to, uh, to have a meaningful response. And I think there is something going on like that in music, that it's, it's, a, it's a way of communicating ideas as well. Yeah, and uh, this is where sort of like uh, a lot of psychological aspects come in, which I think are kind of difficult for, for some people to put into practice, right? If you are, if you are creating music and you're thinking about the fact that it may something may be boring for the listener, which with like a composition like like Justified, I can understand why some people may not have the patience to breathe. It is sort of like something that has been kind of formed by the ent entertainment industry that like there shouldn't be that dead silence, right? In a way, and I have sort of developed the courage, and I really think that's what it is, and. Would be interesting to talk about the concept of what is courage neurologically right so so <laughs> uh, to to do these things anyway so to allow myself to listen 
and to wait for the right moment rather than, than to have that other voice or other voices that tell me, oh, no, you need to do something now because it's boring, right? So it's sort of, it's sort of kind of like really, really getting focusing onto this, this, this sensation or this, this feedback loop of what am I hearing? What are my actions generating here? But not letting other, any other thoughts interfere in that moment. Yeah. So talking about courage, um, I see the way how you do music, like a, like a proper call, like people use the word call when they say, okay. I had this moment in my life that I decided to become a doctor, I decided to become a musician, a neuroscientist or whatever. And no matter what happens next, I'm just gonna persist. Even if the world's falling apart, even if all the, all the music around me is completely against what I'm doing in every philosophical and technical point of view, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try it. Yeah, you, you are the perfect example of that, to be honest. Uh, so. When did you decide to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to stick to my guns and I'm going to just be the best of, of what I can do, uh, but without listening too much of what's happening around me. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's obviously kind of like a long process, but I've had a very interesting, um, I had a couple of very interesting experiences as a child, like at around age six to eight. Okay. Uh, where I had these, this really deep um, epiphany, you could say, like at that age, right? But uh, epiphany of, of uh, my relationship to my parents. So where I was kind of like feeling, and I have to use this word, feeling that I am not my parents and that my parents have different, live in a different world because it's, you know, my father's world, my mother's world, and they don't have, and this might sound sad, but I mean in a good way, they, their worlds have nothing to do with mine, right? So my world is my world, and this is a fact, and I need to accept it. I can't expect that other people do live in my world, let's say, because they, they can't, you know, it's just, this is here, right? And how could anybody enter this? Right? So, so it was a very, very uh, mature thought. Mm -hmm. For a six-year-old kid. Yeah, right? yes. yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. And it turned out that I would say that was sort of like maybe the beginning of, of me realizing I'm an artist, whatever that means again, right? So, so being, being somebody who creates, I create my own world, like through my perceptions, I kind of like had that, that understanding very early on. And then really, I can only uh, remember one, one moment, um, which was when I, I was 20 years old and I got my first Chapman stick, which is the, the first touch style instrument that I played. And I picked it up and up until that point, I had really never practiced anything. Like I was maybe talented enough to pick up a guitar and play something. Yeah. Or I had lessons and like I could play, um, I could play things, but I had never practiced. So I picked up the Chapman stick and I realized, okay, so this is so alien to me. Unless I really make the, the choice to decide, okay, I want to do this and I want to become very good at it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I either do it or I don't do it. And that was sort of like where, where I chose the path of, of I'm going to do this. And it's funny, like that one decision was enough to put me on that path and there was there there was no never any question um and then like the, say the skill set and like the the you know the first thing that i then developed in the mid in when I, in my mid 20s was that i got rid of my stage fright right so that was a big thing also very much an uh uh uh, uh Let's, I don't know. Again, I don't know how it, you know, but it's a psychological thing where the voices that we were, that we were talking about already. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, like if you're performing and there's always like constant commentary, obviously those, that can be distracting and makes mistakes more likely. And since you want to, if you're playing written music, you want to avoid making mistakes. Right. So, 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 um, and I had written um, Carlos Castaneda's uh, books uh, at that time. So, so there was, uh, you know, this idea, 
of Don Juan saying like, yeah, like you have to kind of learn to stop your thoughts, right? So, or the inner voice, the inner dialogue, I think is the word they use. And, and so I was already primed uh, in a way that that was, was, would become a reality at some point. And I remember, I remember that uh, project in which my, my inner voices, which, in which I was able to not silence my inner voices, but to let them be in such a way that they were not distracting. They were not interacting with my performance. And um, and so that was the very important step. But again, it didn't involve any decision anymore. Yes. Right. Yes. And so then on top of that came like all these skills that sort of like uh, make me who I am now. What about the not the inner voices that you wanted to silence, but the yes, the most prominent <laughs> ones that are the external ones. Um, I I I heard Adrian Belou once saying in an interview that he doesn't listen to any music at all. Uh, which I found in the very beginning a bit disturbing because, but then I kind of understood because for an artist like you or like him, that they're very, very peculiar and you you know who is playing immediately with the first three notes. You you can recognize the artist. I think the external world is more like a, like a threat uh, instead of um, something helpful. So do you listen to other things? Do you avoid listening to other people? What's What's your take on this? No, I, I think it largely this this question largely depends on if the person you're asking this question to is a, a interested interested in say which aspect of music making that person is most interested in. So for me, it's always been the music itself. So for me, it's not a question that I need. I I'm listening to music all the time, and I'm especially to the music that inspires me, and also especially to the music that has inspired me all my life. So I think for me, it's important to keep up the relationship with the music that I love. It's like, like with a partner, right? Like you, it's not that you I say, okay, I, I love you. Uh, I love you, uh, Barbara, right? I love you, Barbara, but then you never look at her again for 20 years, you know, just doesn't work like that, right? So, so that's why for me, okay, I listen to music and I'm, uh, I'm always grateful to, to discover something that um, I fall in love with. Uh, something new I fall in love with. It's become rarer these days. Uh, I think not because there's not great stuff out there, but because I'm working on my own music or other people's music so much these days that I just don't have the time. And, uh, you know, uh, we have a small child now. And so these op the opportunity to listen is, uh, is much less. But I love music. And, you know, like you, I can go out to a restaurant and you would have like just a four to the floor kick drum and i move with it and i love it you know i'm i'm very unprejudiced when it comes to music like um because i think for me most music carries something joyful because really it as a matter of fact most people who make music no even if it's functional music they enjoy doing it and so somehow the music carries that spirit and that's why i'm uh i'm just open to any any kind of music and and yeah when it comes to like voices as like uh, obviously like there is there is actual people in your life that say something to you right but then there's also like the social um I ideas the the social norms or even just the uh even just the fact that you need to earn a living uh which is also kind of voice right <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> uh, and 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 uh and that is that is sort of like um like obviously like a more complicated thing but but i have never i have never really lost the um uh the confidence or the clarity that i need to i need to be here doing what i do which is music somehow right like even though there are moments where i i feel feel low and i don't really kind of like uh see the value in doing it and and it's 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 everything so difficult and blah 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 but that is just like just regular mood swings that everybody kind of like has so it's uh, i've never really gotten to the point where i was questioning or also even like other people weren't really questioning what i was doing not even not even my family like like the standard story is that your parents try to stop you from making a big mistake and um uh, but that didn't that didn't happen to me fortunately that's that's i think it it was exactly my 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 case as well um yeah i mean i i don't know how how weird it is to become a scientist uh 
in our days, but uh, yeah, back at home, it generated a bit of uncertainty <laughs> in my parents' brain. Like, what does it mean to become a researcher? What the hell is that? What are you going to research? So yeah, so and I, I get that. But I, I also had this moment of aha that I said, I want to do that. And I just, I, I, I want to do that and I want to do that only. And I call it a call because it's kind of like that. It's, it's a bit silly in the beginning because you say, okay, what if everything fails? I don't mind. I'm just going to go for it. And if you have the support of your family and your immediate environment, I think that's the perfect combo for, for success. Yeah. And obviously, obviously like some sort of uh, uh, social security, right? Which, which I guess, like coming from a country like Germany, it's easier uh, to have that, you know, like versus people in the U.S., for example, right? So yeah, so I was I was lucky, and like my my parents helped me helped me uh, buy musical instruments, and and they brought me to music school when I was young, and they didn't really know what they were doing, and I don't think that the fact that they did that really had the was the main reason why I became a musician. But at least I had the opportunity to, to make the experience that I wanted to become a musician. I'm going to come back to something that you just mentioned, that is, uh, which is this idea that everything comes from within. And at some point you're just uh, accumulating experiences and then suddenly they just manifest consciously. And then you have this, this inspirational moments that you can create. Um, so when you're on tour, for instance, and you need to play every day the same kind of things. I don't know how it works for you, but some people just sit down and they just immediately compose a piece out of nowhere. Some other people kind of accumulate experiences, uh, sights, sounds, feelings, and then they just manifest that immediately as if it was pre-cooked in their minds somewhere in the background. So there are different styles. What is your way of composing? So first of all, like for me, this romanticized uh, way of creation or being being creative has never been really at the forefront of my my being right so for me it was it's always more about the um like we were we were mentioning like the the trigger it's about the trigger so you start doing something and as you do it it appears so you could say like that in my in my brain i don't do much like for me, for me, it is it is the moment where I try to get it out, where mm. it appears. So, so it's difficult for me to even say, is it something that was already there? I would say no, no, because because it's about again, it's about the feedback loops that start happening once you start doing something. Yeah, that that the piece comes or the the piece of music comes alive. I remember my piece Todd Morton Five Thirteen, which is a, a big orchestral piece. Um, happened from from a simple from a simple I came from a simple idea and when once I started like for, uh, creating that piece I had the idea I've had the idea for 10 years but the idea was not something tangible the idea was sort of like was sort of like was sort of like a feeling that is impossible to put into words I actually did find a way to put it into words I wanted it to be like a really bland piece of cardboard <laughs> okay yeah, which that's is very kind of concrete. Like it's, it's, very concrete. Kind of, it's kind of concrete, but yeah. like, and, and it's not like that, no, because I had discovered this, this, this series of notes, which sounded like that to me, like, yeah. like really bland, like nothing. Yeah. Like, uh, and then I was inspired to kind of like turn that into something really, really beautiful and huge. Yes, and by huge. Just kind of, yes, by kind of like blowing up that idea and sort of like, uh, you know, in a way, this is sort of like maybe uh, also part of it, like because I want to uh, prove to myself sometimes um, what can be done. Like, you know, I'm not like one of these people who, you know, I'm inspired by people saying that can't be done. Like if somebody says that, I'm kind of like more inspired to kind of like what could, well, how can we make it this yeah. work? Right? How can I prove you wrong? <laughs> yeah yeah no 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 it's not about that okay. it's not really about it's not really about proving the other person wrong it's it's more about kind of like um believing that uh that there is like a pot potential for for development in us right and that's sort of what it's about it's i'm not a competitive guy at all right so so for example uh, and this is i think this is something that really sh uh, shows in my discography if you're looking at 
like the only the first time that I recorded a guitar album where where you can hear how I can play like in the traditional way like fast and complicated yeah. right <laughs> that album was put out only two years ago okay. or one and a half years ago it's the album called Truce Truce yes, right? yes, yes. yeah yeah so before that I just didn't care I play one note and like people say oh this guy cannot even play right yeah. I heard that many times actually yeah but so I was never, I was never, I never felt uh, like I needed to show uh, what I can do. Yeah. yeah. So no, no. The inspiration to create uh, is is comes from, or the the sometimes the history of a, a piece like it's it's old. Like sometimes like uh, even twenty twenty years, twenty five years old, and then suddenly it falls into place and it it takes. A couple hours to come out like with the string quartet for example a uh, heartland there are like uh, at least half of the pieces were written like for each piece like maybe half an hour and yeah people don't believe that but it's true because it's just it's just like i'm contemplating subconsciously the material for such a long time that then it's only the act of sitting down and writing it down and then it's there so that act of contemplation, I think, I think that's a great, that's a great uh, cue for me. <laughs> that act of contemplation, um, if I understood correctly, something that always tends to happen in the present moment. So it's not, it's not about okay, I have this this audience, and then I'm gonna write something that they like. But if I don't like it, doesn't matter. I'm just gonna try to match whatever they want because I can sell more discs, whatever. It's, no, it's not that. It's just whatever whatever is uh, happening at the moment that you're doing what you're doing, this is very zen, it's very recursive, but it's true. Uh, but that, that implies a very, very specific state of mind of you. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very yes. sharp state of mind to be centered in the moment. So to be able to contemplate, not to judge, to contemplate. Where does that come from? Was it something that you learned or something that it's, has been there all the time, this contemplative Marcus? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, never thought about that. I, I think I've always been like this. Um, however, and this is something I've mentioned a couple times before in other conversations, is that I have had brain injury when I was three years old, and this is why I, why, or this is this one point in my life there where I'm, I'm I can't, that I can't remember obviously, where I say, okay, maybe that did something. To my brain and i could have become a different person i mean it doesn't really even make sense to talk about it because we never know we i'll never, never know. know i will never know however i sort of like uh see as a theme that my that my 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 brain when i talk about myself, like like my, my brain has always had this tendency to 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 reorganize itself to self-organize as you say recursively and like the, the 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 principle and the idea of recursion was present in my in my understanding even when i didn't have the words like this this feeling this feeling of i am a feedback loop right i am i am the feeding back that's what creates who i am that's how i felt always um and then yeah my like i guess my teachers like and and like my main teacher is music Right, so if you if you think about that, like contemplation tends to or can happen when you listen, when you focus on listening. So that's why the eighties, uh, when I grew, grew up uh, and I had my first Walkman, which was just like a, a brand new thing, and I was listening on headphones and I could focus on on the music. That was sort of like the first time I had like consciously practice meditation yeah like a form of meditation yes it is so and and i guess even before i was listening to music and i was in bed like when i had this revelation about my relationship with my parents i was also meditating right so this is sort of like how i see it so it's this theme of meditation has been going on throughout my life but then uh it was definitely meeting robert fripp and and his guitar craft school that sort of uh gave me the the practical tools uh, how to, how to almost, uh, well, how to deliberately generate that state. First of all, in sort of like some more traditional meditation, just sitting in silence, right? 
in the traditional way, but then also in terms of guitar, practicing the guitar in a very, I, let me just say, holistic way and sort of even, let's say, a mathematical and permutational way. Um, and, and then later on, I took that and like what is, what is kind of like, and I, I need to jump there now, what is special about the instrument that I play is that both hands have the same value. There is no picky fretting hand and picking hand. Both hands can play on the fretboard. And so left and right, so this unit, this, you know, this unity also here, mm -hmm. this happens, happens through the hands for me. And like finger uh, dexterity exercises kind of like extend beyond the two halves. Yes. The, the two brain apps, which are literally here, using a physical exercise to stimulate my brain to focus, right, has been with me uh, since I was 20 years old, right? And I'm, I'm 49 now, so it's, uh, it's almost, almost 30 years. Let's talk about the instrument, because that, that is something that uh, for those who uh, just witnessed the piece uh, justified, um, they might be extremely interested if they're no, if they're not, if they're not necessarily musicians. Um, so as far as I know, uh, you started with this trend of, uh, as a leading player of this war guitar and the Chapman thing in the nineties and then in the two thousands, but later on, you, you, you became, uh, you, you started designing your own instrument, which is this U8 and, and U10 touch guitar instrument, which is what we saw and we. We have in the background so for a normal dude like me can you explain a bit uh, what's the difference between a normal guitar your instrument and how do you transition from piano because i understand that you learned piano in the very beginning to classic guitar and then to this to this beautiful instrument so the question like how does it differ you could say like the the u8 is just an electric guitar that's what you could say there's no difference right that is the best way to actually say it and to talk about it. But then obviously there are differences, but these differences are, are major, uh, minor details that make a major difference, right? This is how I see it. So basically, like I designed the guitar with Ed Reynolds, the initial uh, prototype, and, and the idea was to build a traditional guitar instrument. This was like the first thing I said to him was, Ed, I do not want to build anything that, is, that has the flavor of an invention. I want to buy something that is super traditional, that is like where everything, well, everything is in tune with what makes a guitar a guitar, right? So unlike, like this, the Chapman stick is the opposite of that. The Chapman stick tried to get away from that. Um, the war guitar was already more of a guitar instrument and also, um, but more kind of like uh, based based on the bass guitar uh, kind of uh, size Huge. Let's say, and feature. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So so my idea was to sort of like have, have sort of like a, a slightly bigger electric guitar instrument that is, is optimized for the playing technique. And here, here comes what the, really, what the difference is. So with the touch technique, you want to have both hands should have like same, the same sort of access to the, to the fretboard like easy access. So there, there are a few details here that, that are important. So for the, the Chapman stick, for example, is sitting on the chest, so which means you have to put your hands like this. Like my instrument falls, to, falls forward, so it's sitting in front of you and you can't, by default, you can't see the frets, right? So you're, you're kind of like more forced into this, this relaxed position, but where you sort of like have to feel your way uh, to where the notes are. So it takes a, away that, uh, that visual aspect a little bit, which is, I think is, is quite important because the visual as if, if we apply the visual sense in music, when learning a musical instrument, uh, we're sort of taking away so much processing power that the listening is suffering. And when I say listening, and this is, this is kind of like maybe interesting to you, like my definition of listening is all the senses but the eyes. I see. So you listen with your body, you listen, listen with, with, your, body. with your skin. With my, with my fingertips, olfaction, with my skin. You, you can yes. smell sounds. You could, yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And any, any kind of like sense that we really can't really put into words, like the, sub, the subconscious perception, right? 
So, and what, whatever the, the channels are, we don't even need to label them, right? But, but, but uh, so the, the, the UA Touch Guitar was built to make that possible. So for example, on the back, and this is something like very few people know, on the back, it has a, uh, on the back of the body has a cutout for the leg. So the idea of, of there was, first of all, to give you, to give you, to give the instrument a chance to go forward and not sit on your chest. Okay, that's practical in that sense. But then also because there is the cutout, your leg actually has the proprioception here of the where is the instrument. I there. see. So where does it touch? So so like if you change, just change the angle a little bit like this, you f also feel it on your leg. Mm. Um, so so basically the instrument and there is there's a, a cutaway also for the belly so that the instrument swivels on the belly like this so that so everything has been designed in such a way that the ins that the instrument kind of like becomes a moving part of your body and you could say like any other guitar is like that which is true which is true but for for this instrument it was important to find that you, you know, like you can see that in the in the uh, photo behind you the instrument wants to sit in a cert at a certain angle per by default but then it shouldn't be stiff there. It should be able to move. And like we figured all that out. And it's basically an eight string guitar, which covers the bass range and the, uh, so bass guitar range and the guitar range. And even though it sound, it, I call it a guitar, it looks like a guitar. Uh, it is not played like a guitar. And the technique of playing this instrument has nothing to do with fretting. Because what we do is we tap. So you have to put the energy to make this note sound into the string as you bring your finger down. And that is the big difference. And this is also very different from playing a key on the keyboard or on a piano, right? Because here you really are in touch with the vibration right away on the keyboard. Like if it's electronic, then there's no connection whatsoever with the sound. On a piano, you have the, you know, the mechanical parts, you have the hammer, and so it's very indirect, but with a touch instrument, it's that one finger creating the sound, the string starts vibrating, and you're picking up the vibration, even if the instrument isn't amplified, the fingertip pick ups, picks up the vibration right away and creates this really short feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Because I saw you in the video that there is some kind of communication between you and the instrument, that it goes beyond whatever note you're playing at that time, and it has to be with the position. Sometimes you you move forward and then you stop a bit and then you do something else. So it's very interesting what you mentioned because there is some kind of proprioceptive, somatosensory kind of relationship between you and the instrument that is kind of talking to you. So the feedback, the feedback uh, loop that you mentioned is also in relation with uh, the physical aspect of the instrument, right? Yeah, totally, totally. It's, it's sort of like... Uh, um, like maybe people can imagine it if you if you had like uh, like an unpopular object like a baseball bat, right? yeah, <laughs> it's like, right? exactly. And you and imagine you're holding a baseball bat like the big the thick part into your hands like this, and it's a really nicely made wooden uh, bat. It has this really amazing feel, and you kind of like you can slide your hands around it, and you can kind of like experience joy touching that surface. And because you're approaching with two hands like this, you also get sort of like the connection of the hands and you get like you can obviously you can move one hand at a time, right? But what happens is if you if you move both hands at the same time, you like you you become one with that shape. It's like it's like that like t dancing tango yes. or something, yes. right? Yes. In a way, like with a part. It's that it sort is. of like the it relationship is. with the instrument. And that's why and this is kind of like the what makes the U8 so great. Because I made sure that this instrument is the ideal partner for that dance. So it means it should be able to move freely. It should kind of like have a dance built into it, right? So, and, and that's, that's it's, I mean, it's sort of, sort of a long-winded answer, but like, because it is, like I say, it is just a guitar, right? But... Big butt. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. So the second part of my question was more um, 
I'm a very nosy person, so I want to know exactly um, what was the uh, the mental process of Marcus Reuter going from piano to a more classic guitar, and then probably something happened that you, you just mentioned a bit, but can you get into the details of how and why did you decide to go from classical instruments to to this to this uh, to this type of instrument? So uh, you know, like in my history, I started out playing like these small percussion instruments, like mallet instruments, when I was three, four, five years old, maybe, and then the recorder, like you know, this guy, and and mandolin. So I had played a stringed instrument, and then came the the keyboard and the piano for a few years. And then came the classical guitar, and then came the Robert Fripp experience, so the steel string guitar, and that was very short. And then came the Chapman stick and the touch instruments, right? So first of all, like I said, I was never interested in, in, in competing. So obviously that also means like learning an instrument that nobody else is playing kind of like was a good, good thing, because I didn't, I, there was no pressure to, uh, to compare myself with, with anybody else, which, is, which I think really is an advantage of playing a new kind of instrument. Uh -huh. I wanted to be just a, somebody who creates sound worlds. So initially, I would say, you know, just calling me a guitarist is actually wrong. I, I do use the, the touch guitar in order to uh, create something that I'd be happy if somebody else would create it, if they would. Like, so it's not, it's not about my ego on that level. My ego is more in the compo as the composer, right? So that's where I'm interested in, in, that, in being the producer. So not being in the first line necessary. I can be in the second line and be pretty much happy. Um, so that's why the touch instrument kind of like in, uh, allowed for a more open, uh, a, a blanker canvas, let's say, um, to approach, uh, um, you know, sound creation from. And since, you know, I at some, at that age of around 20, I realized, okay, if I want to bring my music out into the world, I have no choice but to be the performer myself first. And, and obviously it's great. I mean, you know, there are other people who are composers and they never perform themselves. But I think for, my, for me, this uh, being such a holistically interested person, I wanted, to, like, know, I wanted to know everything about music. So performance was a big part of that. And the touch instrument, it, you know, like you have to try it. It feels amazing. It, you know, like there's an instrument where, where really like the two hands, they come together. Like even on a, on a piano, you don't have that feeling because like, okay, on the left hand, the low notes are on the pinky. On the right hand, the low notes are on the thumb. And it's kind of like, that doesn't kind of like, obviously it works, right? Like no, no problem about that. But I like this idea that on the touch instrument, everything becomes just a mirror image of each other. So, so these are the high notes, these are the low notes. And it's completely mirrored. And, and that led to like, like my whole, um, I don't want to say invention, but it's sort of like invention slash, slash development of that technique, which is a sort of like, you could say, a, sort of like a physical meditation that takes into account the way the brain works and the way that you can... Uh, and train um, skills into the brain. Yeah, and I, I brought all that together in this in this technique, which I which is uh, funnily enough called the family. The family. Which, uh, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and it's and it's kind of it has a social aspect as well. If you want, if you consider your instrument as an as an other, not just as an extension of you, but something. As something else that can provide certain kind of feedback that it doesn't come from you necessarily. It's yes. kind of it's kind of a dance. It's true. It's kind of a hug. You're hugging your instrument all the hugging. time. Hugging exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So talking about hugs and family and uh, and people, if I'm right, in collaboration with uh, with uh, Trey Gunn, uh, former King Crimson's member, you run the the Touch Guitar Circle at some point, right? And basically, it's kind of AA for uh, for people that touch, that plays this instrument. So it's it's <laughs> it's it's a, it's a teaching and support network. I I haven't I haven't had the pleasure of actually 
touching this instrument, but I can tell from your YouTube channel and that is really hard to learn. You need like a dedicated time and a lot of effort to actually make it sound like like you do. Can you tell us a bit about the, the touch guitar circle and what does it happen there? If someone wants to learn this instrument, what do they need to do? Um, how do they start? So, so basically my journey is, uh, is almost, it's almost 30 years with these instruments. And um, it just takes a long time if you want to figure it all out by yourself. And back then in the early 90s, there was n not much information around. And like the few people who really kn knew, like there were some people who were, who knew, but they couldn't, they couldn't put it into words. So, so for me, it was important to sort of like find a way to, uh, to collect all that information and to formalize it somehow so that it becomes available even to like any beginner. So, so there's just, just, just very, very simple, even just, uh, let's say hypnotic sentences really that are that help to just get you on the right path at the beginning to understand so this is why i'm i'm using these the, uh, metaphors a lot yes. so speaking of the family yeah or or there's like the famous touch release move mm -hmm. the trm so so like once people understand that a release is involved in playing a note so that you sort of consciously play the beginning and the end of a note everything changes so it's these small details that kind of like put people on the right path and the touch guitar circle was is sort of like like friends who play touch instruments who come together and used to come together we started under that name in 2005 and and to to um to get together and to kind of develop these thoughts these ideas these tools for people to be uh you know like like and I, i'm not I'm not joking. I think people can play to play the way that I do. I it took me 30 years. It like to be really on maybe three years for a young person who is who is inspired and really wants to put put some work in. Mm -hmm. Two to three years and anybody can play like I play. That's good news, people. <laughs> it's good news. And you know, for for me, it's like it's 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 wonderful because. I, I've um, enjoyed playing this instrument. I've liked it. Like the idea is so great. It's something really, really, um, it's something very therapeutic also. And so now seeing that there is a way to get people on a path where they very quickly have positive experiences with the instrument has been a, a, a big aim of, of mine. And just, you know, like having kind of like gotten there. And obviously, like we're always like all the time, we're discovering new things. Yes. Right. Yes. But but there is such a foundation, such a tradition available now that people don't need to uh, spend like twenty years in the dark anymore. Yeah. And 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 that's kind of like let's research, right? That's what you do. Yeah. Kind of like that is the idea that as a researcher, you create a, a, a body of work that other people can build upon. And that's that's sort of that's sort of what uh, the touch guitar circle is, and so we used to have at least two meetings per year, one in Europe and one in the U.S., with like between ten and twenty people each time. And so um, obviously, COVID, um, you know, uh, has uh, we not know. helped. We know <laughs> that. Exactly. So 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 this year, I'm now running a, an at a distance course. So uh, using um, you know a weekly email newsletter and um and a, a board like a message board um and it's running it's running for 49 weeks so and we're now in the 38th week 38th. of that course and and so like you see it's a pretty commit committed crowd mm. uh where like and this is for the first time i'm offering such a long course um but it's it's pretty amazing like what uh, you know as a group and also as an individual what you can accomplish in a year if you kind of like stick to it if you stay with it and even if you leave sometimes you can return so this is why like i think like uh, especially for online courses if you just have like a like a three three weeks on a course let's say and you 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 can't concentrate for half of the time you're losing a lot but if you have a, a course that lasts a whole year and you're dropping out for a few days here and there like you still, you, there's always time to get back into it. 
and that's sort of sort of the idea for my also my future education formats where i will allow uh more time for people to always return yes I think that's why I use the AA metaphor. It's a terrible metaphor because if you relapse, you can come back. You can always come back. The family is going to be there <laughs> waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, no, the funny, the funny thing is there is really nothing uh, ideological about uh, Touch Guitar Circle. It's, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just the, the things we play on the instrument. It's like, it's like the principles we apply to the instrument, but it's, there's no... There's no codex um, of some other kind involved there. Not at all. So let's fly a bit, if I'm allowed to, as if we were not flying already. Um, <laughs> you're also a psychologist. Um, and I have this... Um, I, I was the other day thinking, well, so how does it work for someone who is very prolific at something, but then... This person became interested in an aspect of the psychology, of the human psychology. And then what is the relationship between the two things? So I started thinking, is it because Marcus played music before that he decided to get a better understanding of what was going on with himself? Or is it the other way around? Or again, is it some kind of a loop that fits each other? So how was, what's the story behind you uh, studying your degree, your, your psychology degree, and, and how is that related to, to your musical journey? So, so first of all, I was never uh, really driven by the idea to find out more about myself um, because I sort of believed and still believe that that is something that's happening automatically anyway. So it's not something that I oh, ever really needed to enforce. And that, that, at least, you know, that was my thought definitely when I started. But really, the, 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 the really mundane reason is that my teachers back then uh, recommended that I, that I should not study music. Very as simple as that. And, and so I was, I was quite uh, good, I had good grades uh, in high school. So like, it was difficult to kind of like see, okay, what am I mostly interested in? Because all my grades were good. So, but obviously I, I knew I was interested in music, I was interested in pedagogy and uh, all computer programming and uh, mathematics, or so sort of like the obvious for a musician in a way, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, like in Germany, uh, you had to have like a, a numerous clauses, so you had to have a, a you know, a, I don't know what to say, but you had to be good enough in order to be to be to be taken on right so and i was lucky that i had had met that number so um so um i went through this this book of like all the all the different uh courses let's say that or, or uh, subjects that were offered at the universities in germany and like most of it was so obvious to me like okay like this okay Okay, I know what that is about, and then I came to the page which said, which said psychology, and 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 it was like the first time, like there was a little bit of a question mark, like so, what is research? What is psychology as a science? Right? Like, and and I, I'm I'm not talking about therapy or something. I wasn't interested in that at all at that point. It was more like the science of psychology, and so uh, the the university I eventually uh, got to was actually the. Um, uh, university in in Bielefeld, and and that is a is based. It's uh, focused one hundred percent on research. So like like there was almost no courses that were even talking about clinical psychology, right? So it and and it was perfect for me to learn about scientific methods. Uh, like uh, I had like two years of mathematics, like statistics, right? And and it was uh, it was ideal for me to learn that stuff even if i just just kind of like forgot about it again right away but sort of like understanding the principles of um of that back then contemporary research um psychological research was a fantastic foundation for uh living a life yes <laughs> uh, right? yeah. Yeah. yeah so un understanding that like like all the all the bullshit you read in newspapers where like people talk about correlations or blah blah, blah somebody has said yes. that that and that and and you realize okay and people talk about experiments 
but what they are taught, what they say is like in scientific terms, it's not a, it's not an experiment. It's not even an right? experiment. Yes. Uh, yeah. Not even an experiment. Yeah. 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 You know what I mean? Yes. And, and just having, just having that awareness was, uh, was fantastic for me. Um, because I became kind of like super, super aware, sometimes even like annoyingly aware of uh, how the world uh, operates around me. And probably, probably, you know what I'm talking yes. about, because, because yeah, like I became very susceptible at times. And I would say also like the fact that I was, that I was and still I meditate so much, um, kind of like makes, makes you very, um, um, does not necessarily make you more balanced. Even even though that is sort of like the image that people have, like yeah yeah you meditate and you You're get so balanced. so no, detached no. and so yeah no yeah. I, no I think that at first you're getting more annoyed, and then you kind of at least that's how it was for me, yeah. and then I had to kind of deal with that. You yes. know? So that was like the the, the next stage of yeah. of uh, self improvement, let's say. Right, I was pretty much like super happy studying psychology uh, because I was making my music at the same time. So even though I had two things that I was doing so more or less 100%. But since the, mu the music made me happy, you know, studying psychology made me happy. I was also very much interested in the in the historical aspects like that, you know, I, I really enjoyed that as well. And so that was that was basically that, you know, and the connections are to me nowadays are super obvious. Yeah, so like even like taking into account the the mathematical side of things, the, the development of my method, which is, you could say, like, call it exercise, but the always, like, the exercise always carries a certain uh, uh, approach with it, right? Yeah. And, and all these things have sort of come together. And in my teaching, I use a lot of, um, hypno you know, hypnotic language. I, I, I do that a lot. It, it works very, very well in music teaching because, as you know, like, the the... One of like the most powerful ways to make people learn is to leave blanks. So, and I, I do that a lot so that people can develop their own language, their own thinking about musical uh, aspects. Uh, for example, I teach music theory in, in an interesting way where I sort of, sort of instill a storyteller into a person where the storyteller, like, the, like not my storyteller, but the person's internal story, story, storyteller then sort of like explains music theory to the person and then from that the storyteller then becomes the composer and 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 sort of like there's there's so much there's so much overlap um and you know like at some point i i um initially went to some um uh, uh nlp seminars you were listening pro programming yes. yeah and and which is which is which is uh, I don't know what the reputation is nowadays, but it had a bad reputation. But it's actually a super super great thing that is uh, is very very much in tune with uh, with a humanistic uh, worldview. Approach, so yes. it's there, there's not there's nothing no, bad about it. No. And there I learned about like the like the sub the obviously the like you you must be aware of this like. Uh, the idea of submodalities and and that has been like like with me ever since like i really work uh, in my daily work I, I i always use my my knowledge um it's not that i not, not that i see myself as a therapist not at all really but but some people some people uh have that positive that side effect um uh, like when they work with me that they kind of like have some ceiling there's some healing just happens and i think that's and they, i think that's something that also uh, what also my music does somehow and that's why the music the music has be become like my main calling card so not not kind of like earning a lot with my music because it's not mainstream enough has not been such a big problem because i've always made new acquaintances new friends via my music people who work with me who give me who give me some who give me uh work or who take a lesson from me or and so um that's how these things interrelate yeah it's uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the healing part because and it's also interesting that you mentioned that sometimes we don't know what we're doing but what we're doing has an effect that goes beyond the primary objective of what we're trying to um and i remember uh i have a very good friend who who 
who is a clinical psychologist now a neuroscientist and he also he always mentioned Milton Erickson who was a big name in the yeah. hypnosis yeah. Uh, and, yeah. uh, amazing yeah and he had no idea what he was doing he was completely intuitive so he, but, uh, he, he, but you know the back the back story right yes, of Milton yes. Erickson yeah yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so 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 in that way um when you were mentioning that you are actually cueing people with hypnotic kind of suggestions when when they are learning, that's a very Ericksonian kind of method in the sense that he was saying, okay, you can influence someone much better when they have their attention completely focused into something. So if you're actually, I can imagine, this is, this is me imagining what you do with your uh, students. If they're focusing on trying to get a particular, pulling something out, and they are completely focused on that, and you perform some kind of suggestion or hypnotic, I can see why that would work. Because it goes directly to, the, to whatever, whatever in the mind, forgive me, my neuroscientist colleagues, whatever in the <laughs> mind uh, these things are being processed, it has a direct effect. And that has been yeah. shown systematically uh, with these techniques. It has been shown systematically. And like I, I really uh, have become sort of like, without being kind of, uh, in touch with that scene at all, I sort of have become a specialist for for this kind of trance, and 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 my music does the same. Yeah, it's it's not even intentionally, but sometimes intentionally. And I think that the like you just called it that total focus on one thing. That's wrong. Ah, tell me the way it works. You need to kind of like find that contradiction of let's call it familiarity and surprise. And you'd have both and you turn both into one thing. And as you turn this into one thing, like that, that, that hole opens up, that, that, uh, that membrane between conscious and subconscious opens up wide, wide up. And that's when, when suggestions really can yes. go deep and, and can actually create change yeah. that otherwise would be impossible. So I hear a lot of people, and a lot of people that I that I that I really uh, regard highly, sometimes say that you cannot, that you cannot change people, that you know, or that you can, like, which also implies you cannot help people, right? And I mean, and it's not really about helping, right? This this is also not the, the whole point, but but I do believe there is a way to have a positive influence, um, and and. If and I know I know a lot of people who are kind of like in the healing arts and they don't even know it, or they don't they don't they're not aware of it or they don't talk about it, but that's what they do, right? And they do it they do it by the way of suggestion. So that's uh, that's one link that I think that is absolutely obvious to me when I listen to your music is that this is in some way it sounds therapeutical to me, or at least I get into a specific mental state that I I would like to call it a trance. I don't know what that is, but but you get into these very reflective, me meditative, contemplative kind of states. And that's not an accident, I would say. I think you, you manufacture it on purpose uh, in some way. The trance, the trance, this may be interesting. Like my definition of it um, uh, is that it's as if you're looking something up in a table in your, in your mind. It's that moment of like where I ask you which day it is today, right? And you, it takes a split second for you to say, Whatever yeah. it is, uh, Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and and that that is that is sort of like the 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 smallest and the, the purest form, let's say, in a way, of a trance is that moment where at what we were talking about, where the attention goes from the outside to the inside, right? For that brief moment, and 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 this is what I mean, like like then the this this really deep trance where we can go where we can go deep through that membrane, let's say, is is when we create an oscillation where the brain goes in and out or the, the, the whatever, not <laughs> yeah. the brain, it goes, goes in and out of that state, right? And it goes faster and faster and faster and faster. And then it becomes totally malleable at some point. And, and yeah, and you know, that's what I have been sort of like even practically in the way that I create these, uh, these feedback loops that you heard in Justify, for example. This is all recursive. Like what you're hearing there is recursive looping. So there are two loopers that record that are recording what I do, and they feed back on top of each other. So you have like a super complex 
reordering, reorganizing of the sonic of the sonic particles, let's say, into something new. And this is this is the part of the music that the brain, the subconscious brain, I just I just say this, is capable of decoding because that's what the kind of structures that we are faced with anyway all the time, but it hardly ever comes to the conscious surface. And then the music, like the notes, or maybe like I'm playing a minor third. Okay, people know that sound. They know that like there's, there's f something familiar about it, but there's also something that makes you slightly uncomfortable. Yeah. So it's both. And you basically said that in your, in your, when you described the music at the beginning, right? So it's a little bit of both. Yeah, it's very nice. It's kind of, but it's also dark and it's also black. Yeah. And this, like, like having these, these, these different uh, poles of, of things kind of like connected in the same space sort of creates the creates the, the trance the recipe for the trance yes yeah yeah i have a question for you and i i've been trying to ask this question to a professional musician if that whatever that means it has nothing to do with music but it has everything to do with music so i've been i've been meditating for almost a year and a half and i realized that the technique that i'm practicing relies on mental repetition of a sound Mm -hmm. And then when you repeat this sound in your mind, the mind immediately starts calming down. And you end up in very, 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 um, I would say, joyful uh, places that have no content anymore, that, that, that there are no more thoughts anymore. There's just sense of being. But what I want to focus is on the sonic and the repetition aspect of it, because there is something that I cannot, I don't know what it is. There is something about repeating, about looping sounds mm -hmm. that has this innate kind of trance and this, this, yeah. this, this uh, way of evoking this very, very mellow, calm, steady state, if you want, states of mind that I don't know what it is. Is it the repetition itself? Is it the fact that there is something about what we were discussing about iterations? of same sonic modes that calms the mind. What have you, you need to know about this, but you, I can see clearly that you, you put that into practice in your music. Yeah. There is some yeah, element yeah. that is super strong about repetition in different ways that yeah. creates this very, very, very um, kind of contemplative states that it's the same kind of thing that some techniques in meditation uh, use. So do you yes. see a relationship between repetition and, and evoking uh, altered states of consciousness? Um, for sure. And again, like you're the scientist. Uh, <laughs> about I, I that. wish but, I could know. But, 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 but I think, I think it's, it's very simple. Like the things around us, we ourselves, like it's like everything has some sort of like time, at least like how our, our consciousness sort of like structures things has that time factor and like once you have that time factor oscillation becomes a reality right so the the idea of oscillation like if you don't like if there's no time like you could say okay everything is kind of like frozen but as soon as you start having the time so you get oscillation so obviously repetition induces repetition or you could say induces oscillation so that means if you just like, if you imagine uh, your brain like firing like crazy and super chaotic and blah, 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 and you have that thought and that thought and blah, 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 and you, and you, it, you give the brain stimulus that kind of like uh, makes it focus on one particular period of repetition, somehow, and I know that people use this word synchronization, like yes, brain, exactly. like, brain and, synchronization. And, 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 yeah, Famous. yeah. And I, and I don't know, I don't know this, this, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's a real thing, right, that you can measure. Yeah, right, probably it, you can, you can, yes, yes, yes. So and that is the explanation. And I think that uh, that uh, uh, the, the four seasons do that with us, right, just like it's the, uh, the, the month, like the moon phases, the sun going up and down, like like these these circadian rhythms in the body, like like all of this is sort of like what we're dealing with. That's repetition, like like and and the repetition again. The repetition is not something that means something repeats the same way all always because 
the repetition is more of a controlling factor. It's not the reality itself. So repetition means say, okay, we have day and night in the summer, but we have day and night in the winter. And it's quite different, but it's still day and night. You see what I mean? Yes. So, so, so that's how repetition kind of like works. So it, 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 it synchronizes what we experience as the physical body with the with the outside and the outside can be a sound that's being looped or whatever and immediately uh, well if you if you are up for that as you know because people can also tune that out but if you're up for that you just ah uh, listen and you kind of like become like you can like like the four four kick drum yes, i was talking exactly. about exactly it creates that okay yeah it, it, and it goes via the body into the into the mind and your brain starts pulsing at that rhythm somehow again like i don't know what exactly that means but it's it's i i I totally agree with you that there is some there's some intrinsic component about repetition that is present in our daily experiences at all levels and that we tune into that uh, externally yeah but there is some other aspect that is completely endogenous like the the act of repeating something in your in in the eye of your mind sort of to say that generates is very very calm or in tune states as well so i think so you make you're making a distinction between those two things right but is is i'm making a distinction only based on the experience of centering your attention inwards yeah yeah and just getting into the beat of something that you are listening to for instance that is completely externally driven so i'm trying to make the distinction between the two what i'm saying is that for some reason Mm-hmm. there is a moment where the two things the barrier between external and internal tend to disappear and when you're actually listening to a tune that is very engaging and it's and it has this structure that you refer to the mind naturally tends to start looking within and you you naturally tends to go into this deeper and deeper calmer and calmer places uh but it's in it's externally induced but there is a point in which you flip the mirror and the mind starts looking t- at itself and i think yes. not that many in my modest opinion not that many music can do that no mm-hmm. it's yeah. re- it's yeah. rare it's not something that you you list you put the 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 radio and you just have this kind of experiences uh, again to me as a musician it's obvious why that is the case because again you need the courage to let people experience their their uh mortality or you could say to experience that they're actually alive Mm -hmm. you know that's kind of like how we really have to put it yeah yeah Yeah, yeah, but that's really how we have to put it and 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 uh you know the states of trance or like as you say meditation that is the moment where you actually feel yourself like it's how you know how you know like however strange that may sound if i say this but but that, those are those are those are the moments where you are alive, and and where where you can have also that um, yeah I know that enlightening mo- you know that's why enlightenment is sort of like the idea of enlightenment is tied to uh, gurus meditating like four yeah, years exactly, or right. something like that right but but, <laughs> but, but yeah but you know yeah but but anyway yes go ahead sorry. yeah so so I I agree that uh, it depends how you define enlightenment but. For some of the old traditions in India, it's not about being in a Himalayas living 50 years. It's about the realization that that awareness that illuminates your mind is the source of everything. And if you're capable of start looking at that awareness itself with the, with the musical experience, with any transcendent experience, in particular with music, that's when you actually become enlightened. Not, not if yeah. you're living yeah. in a mountain for 50 years. It's realizing about the source of your mind which is the awareness that illuminates that 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 mind yeah yes and and i think that probably not all music but a lot of music that kind of like uh puts people into that state is at least in now in our culture in central europe um is not very popular for obvious reasons for, yeah for kind of obvious reasons exactly yeah. right yeah. yeah but but there there is there is also, it's also obvious that it's something that we need. Mm. Uh, and when I say we, like, okay, yeah, uh, whoever yeah. that is. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in that sense, do you think uh, that this type of music, without any attempt of becoming saying something extremely pedantic, 
that might become some sort of antidote for for all of the madness that we have in the world in terms of uh, this constant monkey mind that we're jumping from one thing to another and uh, meeting A, B, C, D. And, but there are no kind of moments where we actually, except when we're with family, except what we are experiencing, this kind of transcendental experiences, that they, they don't need to be like transcendental in the sense of tapping into some other dimension, but mainly about what you were mentioning, to, to, to feel alive, to, to know, to be there. To just be, do you think um, the music, this type of music, might contribute to that uh, to that uh, healing procedure of society? But you know, you know that uh, there's always two two sides, right? To to uh, to that process. There's like the medicine, and, and there's the medicine, and there is the person who is sort of have to has to apply it. Right, so so your, I I think yes, music has the power to have a real positive influence. Like there's no question about that. But do people want to go there? As like people, people as like the majority, the, the collective I, uh, consciousness, the collective. Yes, yeah. yes. I I I'm not I'm not so sure. Mm. I think there's there's more needed, and it's not. I think music is both it can both be the 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 healing uh, like the medicine and it can also be the doctor I think but the doctor part right is not very well developed yeah. so how can make music heal a person in so far that that person then will want to take the medication without the doctor being around that's sort of that's sort of like yes. the question, and you know how it is for people with uh, clinical depression. Like if you get off your meds, uh, you won't you won't take them again because you are, are not in the mind, like for some people, to kind of like understand that you need to take yes. them. Yes. And 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 that is that is that is kind of like the same thing I think with thinking about music as sort of like a healing uh, device. Device. Yeah, that it's it is really not that easy. There is there's more about it, and there is something that I can't really can't really judge, and I don't I don't have a solution for. Right? Yeah, I'm not demanding a solution. <laughs> I just wanted to know <laughs> your your thoughts. I, I, well, I would like I would like to have some idea about a solution, though. Yeah. Like so. Yeah. So talking about the future, something that we have been uh, kind of uh, neglecting. <laughs> In in uh, we have been emphasizing the present moment and this contemplative state. So if I look around and if I listen everything that is being played on the radio at the moment, and in general in 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 our in our current culture state, I cannot see, unfortunately, and I I, I hope I'm absolutely wrong. How another genius like Mozart or another Stravinsky or another Beethoven can emerge, I I don't see how. Why? For very different reasons. But I think one of the main factors is the fact that in our times, we have something called over-specialization, which is the fact that now the world is so diversified that you need to become very good at one thing. Yeah. If you are not good at one thing, it's very hard to get a job. It's very hard to, to make a living. In the past, that was kind of different. So the, the geniuses were actually very good at Mostly everything. A lot, a lot of things. A lot yeah. of things. So all the musicians that were that I consider geniuses and probably you as well, they they not not only knew music, they knew about science, they knew about philosophy. They were they had friends that they were also from another areas. It was a different yeah. it was a different world. So as a very good uh, friend of mine used to put it one one day, he said, We we will end up knowing everything about nothing. So we will end knowing <laughs> more and more and more about a tiny, tiny thing that we will end up knowing everything about nothing. Mm -hmm. That's a very pessimistic view, I agree. Uh, but first of all, do you agree in some part with what I, what I just said? And do you see any escape to this? How can we start building up the... How can we, how can we create the conditions for another Mozart to happen or for another Stravinsky to happen? I'm not sure I, I I want to answer that question, but we'll we'll see. But um, I think you should never underestimate people. Good. 
that's that's sort of like the first like if you made a mistake in what you just said is that you were sort of like understanding which happens all the time to all of us but i agree that there's sort of like the tendency where you say like you have to be very good at one thing yes that is that is uh, the result of the industrialization as far as i'm concerned that's how i understand yeah. it because that that is sort of like you become one part of a machine and so the better you do your job like you know the better the machine works okay so that's that one thing however i think what is maybe like more of a problem is that you that most uh, or a lot of people don't really need to be good at all anymore in what they do so that is the problem it's not the specialization it is the fact that you that you can get by in this world not educating yourself and that is that i think is the is at the core or that's the source of a lot of problems and of the divide yeah in any way let's say is education and when i say education i'm not talking education in the in the current way i'm talking about the the human the human aspect of like like i'm here and i want to make the best out of whatever and i want, want to make the best for myself yep. and for others right so which i think is in in terms it's initial it's linked really it's like you know and and that has somehow like like gotten lost that that there is sort of and i actually read that uh like on your podcast somebody is talking about emptiness yes all right yeah, and so that, yeah. and I, I i haven't watched that that episode but i was thinking okay like like what is what is real emptiness or what does emptiness emptiness is emptiness that you don't need to fill mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that would be my short answer to that question yeah, what yeah. is emptiness yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh so anyway so this there's a i think the problem is that there's a lot of emptiness in people uh and they for some reason that they want to fill it with something and that's where the consumerism and all of these things kind of like come in and they kind of like stop you from really uh as we were talking about focusing on one thing or being like really really passionate about one thing and and this is this is kind of like like maybe the saddest thing i've come uh by in my life that i've seen seen people that are that are uh uh that have apathy of some sort like where there's no there's no passion in their lives or even even beyond that no interest in anything whatsoever and what i mean with interest is passion so yes. it's kind of like the same thing right yeah. so 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 it's that is sort of like the the so the the root of like what we could look at mm -hmm. so 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 this is why and this is like i go back to my teaching methods so this is why for me the storytelling aspect is so important so that's why i need to install this the the inquisitive mind in the person yes to then become a composer if you're not asking yourself the question okay what would it sound like if i play the note b after the note a if you don't ask that question you're not going to be composing and a lot of people approach things in this life that they believe that they need to know already what it sounds like to follow the note a up with the note b but no it's not true no you have to experience it so you have and in order to experience you have to develop an interest and a passion mm -hmm. to finding out what these two notes sound like yeah. so i could now get up sit down at the piano and play an a and a b and i would know what it sounds like but i need to be interested in finding out and that is the problem so that's why i think some sort of solution would be to 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 help people develop a passion to help people find their inquisitive minds find their interests right and then it doesn't matter like you know it can be anything you can be interested in football and soccer or whatever it's okay right but at least there's something you're interested in and and you know so but i i see a lot of emptiness and and that is that is kind of like uh, i think what you're referring to and that's it's that emptiness that makes like you say that makes um geniuses which i think there are plenty around um not being seen right so 
but but who knows maybe they will be seen like maybe in 200 exactly. years exactly that's we, yeah. like yeah, that's the counter argument. Like, oh, Andres, you're being unfair because you're living like a fish <laughs> in the water. You have no idea what's, that you are actually swimming in water. Uh, but I, I really like your your response. So on this very high note is that <laughs> we're going to close our conversation for now. Uh, okay. Is there anything that's going on uh, with you, any band, any new tour, anything planned that you would like to uh, promote here? So with the with the recent uh, uh, breakdown of Facebook and stuff, uh, what I suggest is that people go to my website marcusreuter.com, marks with a K, and sign up for my mailing list. So like anything that's important, I I will be sending out like maybe like once or twice per month at the most, and uh, you know, uh, come see me, um, have a lesson with me or whatever. That's sort of like what I'm interested in, and the shows. They are slowly coming back, and I hope to be on tour in the U.S. in April, uh, twenty twenty-two, already. Already, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, so not so much going on here in Europe. Um, I will probably play uh, three more shows this year: um, Czech Republic and Italy. But uh, that's going to be it. Yeah. So if you want to learn with Marcus himself, um. Just, just sign in. Just go to the website yes, and, exactly. and check it out. Yeah. Okay, so yes. thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Oh, thank you, Andres. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.